think I would But I can guarantee that what you see is not reality Never tell she makes a point to make a killer boy Hello there YouTube, my name is Mike Smith and welcome to the latest What I've Been Watching segment, week number 9. 9. Now I realize it's been sort of a while since the last What I've Been Watching segment, but I mean I've said this in other reviews and I'll say it again now. This is the last couple weeks of my semester at college, so uh, I've had increasingly less time to you know watch movies in my spare time. Uh, so, in fact, I mean, the two, the first two movies that I'm bringing up today are both movies that I watched for a class. Uh, but that does not, that does not change the fact that they are indeed movies, and I did indeed watch them. Thus, what I've been watching. So there you go. All right, the uh, first movie I want to talk about is, uh, one that I watched for my documentary class, as I already said. Uh, it is called Roger and Me. Uh, the 1989 movie directed by Michael Moore. Uh, this was Michael Moore's first movie. Now, uh, I want to talk briefly about my familiarity with Michael Moore. Uh, I mean, obviously I'm familiar with Michael Moore as a public figure. Um, you know, I personally, I l like the guy. I mean, I think he's okay. You know, a lot of people don't like him, and that's fine. I, I, I totally understand that. He kind of comes off unlikable, I guess. But I don't know. There's just something about him that I kind of like. Uh, but I think he's a good filmmaker. And uh, I haven't really seen much of his movies. I've seen Bowling for Columbine, and now I've seen Roger and Me. And so, basically, Roger and Me is about uh, the General Motors factory in Flint, Michigan, which is shut down, and uh, Flint, Michigan thus goes into like poverty because everybody worked at the General Motors factory. And that's where Michael Moore grew up, so it's a very personal film for him, uh, really. And it's a really entertaining movie. I mean, it's serious. Like, it's a serious issue that, it, I mean, I'm not totally sure how Flint Machine is doing now. I didn't do any research into it. This movie is about 20 years old. But uh, it was really interesting. Uh, very, you know, serious subject. But it was also very funny, which I liked. It was, you know, a lot of humor interjected throughout. Um, specifically... Um, there were multiple attempts to try to get Roger Smith, the CEO of General Motors and the Roger of the title, Roger and me, uh, various, various attempts to try to get an interview with him. And, uh, he kept getting shut down and that was kind of humorous, like his sarcastic remarks about it and stuff. Uh, and also the use of juxtaposition in this movie is awesome. Like it's really great. Specifically, I'm thinking of one scene where he's playing, uh, the Beach Boys song, you know the one. Okay, it's totally escaping my mind at the moment, but I know the song. Of course, I know it's a very famous song. I know it. I've heard it a million times, but I, it's escaping my grasp for whatever reason. But he's playing a, a really upbeat Beach Boys song, you know, as the camera's like panning over these streets of like poverty and depression, and it's. Uh, really well done. Like, I really like that. Uh, that's it. The movie does have, like, a clear agenda. You know, it has an agenda that it's trying to push across and, like, force down the viewer's throat, like any Michael Moore movie. But all in all, I really enjoyed it. It's good stuff. Uh, very important in, like, the world of documentary filmmaking. So if you're into that, if you like documentaries, you like Michael Moore movies, but you haven't seen this one, I'd check it out. I like it. The second movie I want to talk about is uh, The Thin Blue Line, 1988, and directed by Errol Morris. Uh, this movie is absolutely fascinating. I really dug it. I mean, this uh, the whole backstory to this movie is just incredible. Um, long story short, this guy, Randall Dale Adams, uh, was convicted and sentenced to death for a murder that he didn't commit uh, in 1976. Uh, and this movie was made in 1988. So he was, he was on death row for 12 years and this, uh, the director, Errol Morris, who is also a very big figure in the documentary world, he, um, you know, got wind of this story and he, like, did his own research. He talked to so many people about it. And it's a, just a really interesting story. And it's worth noting that through the popularity of this movie, uh, Randall Dale Adams, the prisoner, was released uh, because 
of the new light that was shed by this movie, which I thought was really cool. Other than just the story behind it, it's a really well-made film. Uh, throughout the movie, it shows like reenactments of the murder from different points of view. And uh, I thought that was really great. I mean, I made a joke on Twitter that reminded me of the Mysterious Mysteries episode of Invader Zim, uh, which it did, but that's probably because Invader Zim was parodying this. Uh, I really like that. And the score to this movie is incredible. Just a phenomenal score by Philip Glass. Just It's a really powerful uh, music that really just like sets you in the scene. It's just like it's intense. It, it gets you in the mood for this movie. It's really great. So... Yeah, I definitely recommend The Thin Blue Line. I thought it was a really, really great documentary um, and an absolutely fascinating story. And I will probably check out more of Errol, Moore, Errol Morris's work if I get a chance. I mean, I haven't really seen much of other of his stuff. I know he just came out with a tabloid, which also sounded interesting. I wanted to check that out if I had a chance, but uh, that's not playing anywhere near me, so whatever. Um, but yeah, I really enjoyed Thin Blue Line. I think you should go check it out. The third movie I want to talk about is the 2011 movie Limitless, directed by Neil Berger. Uh, this movie just became available on Netflix Watch instantly, and I watched it you know, this past week. Um, Limitless stars Bradley Cooper, Robert De Niro, and Abby Cornish, and it's about a man who starts taking this drug that allows him to... Uh, what's the, the way they put it in the movie, you know how your brain can only access 20% of its brain? Uh, which, I mean, I, I totally misquoted that, but they do say 20%, which is not, I believe, the correct... I, I believe it's 10%, and even when that's the case, it, it does access every part of your brain just at different times, but whatever. Uh, it's like, well, this allows you to access the other 80%, and he just starts, ta starts taking this pill and he becomes smarter. Uh, he becomes more of a focused person. Uh, and that starts yielding really positive results, and he keeps taking it, and then that starts having some negative impacts, uh, which is, uh, he becomes a very much, okay, so, this movie, the, the plot of this movie involves Bradley Hooper becoming so much more focused at what he does, which is ironic, because this movie is very unfocused. I have no idea what this movie was trying to do. It was, um, it was stupid. Uh, okay, let me backtrack a little bit. Uh, I'll say that it was somewhat impressive visually. Like, visually, it's an ent interesting, entertaining movie. Uh, and it's so qu it's so quickly paced. Things happen really fast. Uh, so as that, like, it sort of is able to hide some of its faults th through that way. Like, he gets, like, he meets up with the guy and starts taking the drug within, like, the first ten minutes of the movie. Uh, so... Right away, like, I'm not invested in the characters at all. It's clear this movie's just trying to be entertaining. And it succeeds... It almost succeeds. It really almost succeeds. Uh, it's not terrible. It's not terrible. But it's just... I don't know. Bradley Cooper and Robert De Niro and Abby Cornish, they were fine in it. But the script, it's just the script really dragged it down. It's a movie that feels like it thought it was a really smart movie and tried to make it seem like a really smart movie, but it's not a smart movie. It's clearly not a smart movie. Check it out if you want to see some cool visuals, because I think the visuals are fairly impressive. I thought it was fairly well directed, if not all that well edited or written, uh, but it's really not much else. I, 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 would, I personally probably wouldn't watch it again. That's me. You, we have the fourth thing I want to talk about, uh, the 1979 drama Kramer vs. Kramer, directed by Robert Benton. Uh, I had never seen this movie, so I was uh, looking forward to that. Um, basically, I mean, this is the movie that won Best Picture at the Oscars in 1979, which, uh, now having seen it, uh, I understand why. Although, personally, Apocalypse Now really should have won that award, but that's my own personal thing. Don't worry about that. Uh, but it's a really great movie, a really just emotional Dustin Hoffman, Meryl Streep, fantastic in this movie. It's very effective. Uh, and Justin Henry, the little kid, six-year-old kid in this movie, he's great. I mean, actually, I, I did some research after the movie. It turns out he was nominated for an Oscar for his role, uh, which makes him the youngest person, I believe, to ever be nominated for an Oscar. I totally understand why, honestly. I mean, I, I, I mentioned recently that I hate most child performances, and I do. And this isn't helping my case that I hate most child performances, but I really liked him in this movie. 
Um, but that's not the undercut. It doesn't hop in Meryl Streep. Uh, their performances and just the script, it allows you to see like both sides of the perspective on this situation that they're involved in. And basically, for a quick uh, refresh on the plot for Kramer vs. Kramer, uh, Dustin Hoffman and Meryl Streep are married, and Meryl Streep decides that she's not satisfied, she needs to get out, and she leaves Dustin Hoffman with uh, Justin Henry. And Dustin Hoffman goes on for months uh, balancing his work life and being a single dad, and then Meryl Streep comes back in later and wants to take custody of the kid. Um, and I was expecting something more along the lines of, oh, Meryl Streep's an awful person, Dustin Hoffman just, you know, he's the man. And, I mean, that's how it was at first, And but then once you get to uh, Meryl Streep's scene in the courtroom, like, that was a really great scene, and it really let you kind of into what she was feeling at the time. Uh, very emotional stuff. I highly recommend Kramer vs. Kramer. Uh, I will, as a brief side note, it does not feature Michael Richards, or the host of Mad Money. So if you're looking for either of those Kramers, you're out of luck. This is a different Kramer versus Kramer. However, I will personally fund a movie featuring Michael Richards and the host of Mad Money in like a boxing match or something. If, if I could do that, that'd be awesome. So that brings me down to number five, which is not a movie. Uh, this is a video game. Uh, Uncharted 3, Drake's Deception. Uh, which is developed by Naughty Dog. Uh, a little background. I absolutely love the Uncharted games. I love them. Uh, Uncharted 2 is possibly my favorite game of all time. I'll, I'll backtrack a little bit. My five favorite games of all time are Uncharted 2, Kingdom Hearts 1, uh, Ms. Pac-Man, I love Ms. Pac-Man, uh, Donkey Kong Country, and Rock Band 2. And Uncharted 2 just blew my mind. Uncharted 1 I loved as well. I got that when it first came out. Because uh, I was a big fan of Naughty Dog because of their work on the Jack and Daxter games. And so I was really looking forward to Uncharted. It totally met my expectations. Uncharted 2 blew me away. Uncharted 3, characters and gameplay are as rich as ever. Uh, such a good story. Uh, Charlie Cutter is a new character in the game. Uh, I'm specifically saying this, but he is awesome. I hope to see more of him. I want him in Uncharted 4 if that ever happens. I want a Charlie Cutter spin-off game. Whatever it takes, I want to see more of Charlie Cutter. Uh, I did have a couple of minor qualms with uh, the story, uh, specifically the cruise ship sequence, which gameplay-wise was a lot of fun. I really enjoyed that sequence. But uh, I found that I, it, it felt more of a sidetrack to me. It just felt like it really distracted from the whole overall narrative of the game. Uh, which I understand for games, it's gameplay first, story second, but Uncharted has always been able to meld those so perfectly together that I felt this was a little extraneous. But, you know, I digress. It was still fun to play through and I enjoyed it, but uh, just that whole sequence where Drake was kidnapped and he had to fight his way out of the cruise ship, it felt a little tacked on to me. That That's my personal issue. Uh, but everything else was a lot of fun. I really enjoyed it. Um, it's not quite as brilliant as Uncharted 2, but... Then again, what is, you know? I mean, Uncharted 2 is really awesome. Uncharted 2, uh, it's the only game I can think of where as soon as I beat the story mode, I just started a new file immediately afterwards and just played right through it again because it was awesome. Uh, just a really great series. Uh, I really love Uncharted, obviously, um, and I can't wait to see what Naughty Dog does next. I mean, I'd like them to do Uncharted 4, but I also would not be averse to them going back to Jack and Daxter, so or or a new thing would be cool too. So. so yeah, that's about it, YouTube. That's my what I've been watching. I'll be seeing My Week with Marilyn and Take Shelter at some point in the next week. And then Melancholia and Tinker Tailor Soldier Spy over the weekend. And I'll be seeing the Goonies this weekend. I mean, okay, granted, I've seen Goonies a hundred times. But a movie theater is playing it nearby, so I'm gonna go see it in a movie theater. And then I'll probably talk about it on my next what I've been watching because I feel like just seeing like seeing a good movie in a movie theater is just it's always great. Uh, in any case, so long YouTube, and uh, I've given you I, I've given up on thinking of a catchphrase at the end of my videos. So, wimmy wham wham wazzle.